Hey guys, Will here. So today we're going to be taking a look at the eSports Sim FSW or Formula Steering Wheel version 3. Now this is one of the most interesting steering wheels we've ever looked at here at Booster Media. And we've looked at a lot of steering wheels. So this has got a really, really interesting set of features that set it apart from any other wheel that we've ever tested here at Booster Media. So let's dive in today, unpack this, show you what it's all about and determine whether this might be the steering wheel for you. Let's get started. So there's a lot to cover today, but before we get started, as always, firstly, a bit of important information for you to be aware of, just so you have the full context of exactly what we're doing here today. So firstly, a big thank you to Esports Sim for sending across this wheel for us to check out. Now, as is always the case here, we do like to cross compare against a couple of other alternatives. Now, in this case, most of the other wheels that come with a similar kind of feature set to this wheel are quite a bit more expensive, but we're gonna compare them anyway, just so you have a good understanding of where the value lies and what might best suit you. So it's important that you know that everything that we're gonna be looking at in today's video was also sent to us under the exact same conditions. Now, if you do decide you wanna pick up any of the gear that you see in today's video, whether it's this wheel or any of the other wheels that we talk about or anything else, check the links down in the description below. There are some affiliate links there which are an amazing way of helping support our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost to you. So that's just something that's there if you find our content valuable and you wanna help support us without it costing you a cent. So thanks very much for your support there. But as is always the case here at Boosted Media, no third party has any sort of input into anything that we're saying today. We've gone back and forth a little bit with them with some questions. We'll share some of those answers with you in today's video as well, but it's important that you know that they don't have any control ultimately over anything that we're saying here, purely just sharing my own opinions and my own observations on this wheel, nothing more, nothing less. So let's get in now and talk about pricing. So there's a couple of different configurations available with this wheel. The one that you see in front of us today is the PC version, which can actually be converted over by yourself to Thrustmaster. If you're looking at the Fanatec compatible version, you do actually need to pre-order that through them. And the reason for that is they do a couple of things in terms of wiring to actually prepare the wheel to be mounted with a Fanatec base. Now we don't actually have the Fanatec version here, so we're not gonna talk about that a whole lot today, but I will give you a basic understanding of how that operates so you understand whether it might be suitable for you. So for the configuration, that you see here, you're looking at 1,169 euro excluding VAT. Now it goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway, just make sure that you check your local taxes, local import duties, shipping costs, and whatnot, just to make sure you don't have any nasty surprises there. So in that basic configuration, you get a 70 millimeter bolt pattern uh, quick release hub on the back here. We've got our zero play uh, wheel side quick release mounted to this already, but so you can just mount whatever quick release you want onto here. If you're looking at the Fanatec version of it, you're looking at 240 euro extra, and that actually gets rid of the two clutch paddles on the wheel. So if you're wanting to add those back in, it's an extra 149 euro. From what I understand though, and correct me on this in the comments if I'm wrong, but I don't think that those additional paddles actually work with the, uh, with the Fanatec configuration, which is the reason why they take them off. You can also order it with a Thrustmaster style quick release. That is an extra 39 euro, which I actually think is pretty good value considering that it is a beautiful CNC machined piece of uh, aluminium there. So very, very high quality there. Now, obviously it's not as intricate a piece of machining with moving parts and whatnot, like what you have with a QR2 Pro, for example, from Fanatec. But I mean, this, this I think when you compare to the cost of a QR2 Pro, uh, given that it's you know the same kind of quality finish on the product, I think it's a pretty reasonable price at 39 euros. So that gives you PC compatibility on Thrustmaster. If you're wanting PlayStation and Xbox compatibility through a Thrustmaster base, is an extra 10 euro on top. So you're looking at the adapter for 39 plus an extra 10 when you order it. And that is again, just for the changes that they do in the wiring to make sure that it's fully compatible there. And we'll talk about how that all works as we get on through today's video. So comparing that pricing against a couple of other alternatives that we've looked at here in the past, and this is by no means completely exhaustive. Now, unfortunately I don't have it here anymore we had to send it back, but the Thrustmaster SF1000 wheel, which is probably the most similar visually to this particular wheel. The build quality that we have here is quite a lot higher than what we have on the Thrustmaster. Not really in the same ballpark at all, in fact. But in terms of the feature set, again, this is this this does have a lot more features than that wheel does, but that does have quite a lot of telemetry data and features on it as well. So that wheel comes in at, uh, what is it? 399.99 euro at the time that we're making this video. Of course, check local taxes and shipping on that one. Um, so yeah, not really in the same ballpark. That's definitely a more entry level wheel than what we're getting here. This is definitely a step up in quality. So I'd say if you're a big fan of that wheel and you're looking for that next step up with similar but better functionality, but a similar overall kind of design and feel in the hands, then this is probably a good consideration there. Uh, in that kind of lower price bracket underneath this price point as well, you've also got the Leox 
XF1 Pro. There's also a sport model as well, but we've only looked at the Pro, so we'll talk about that. Similarly, this does also integrate nicely into the Fanatec and Thrustmaster ecosystems too. Again, you can check the full review of this wheel too. Now, look, this, this probably overall is a bit of a step up in terms of build quality from the SF1000 wheel. Uh, just better quality feeling shifters, metal touch points for all of the encoders, a much smaller wheel overall. So again, check out the full review of this particular wheel. I was very impressed with it for the price point, but not really in the same ballpark in terms of overall functionality and uh, you know just overall build quality feeling in the hands and whatnot as what you get here. And this card comes in at a base price of 439.95 euro uh, for the USB version. We do have the additional paddles on the top here, which does bump that price up a little bit. So check out the full review for more details on that guy as well. Uh, we also have the Solpec Spectra XR wheel, which I was very, very impressed with. We looked at this uh, just a short while ago here at Boosted Media. So again, check out the link in the description for the full review of that. This guy comes in at 1499 euro. Higher build quality overall in terms of the materials used. It's got an aluminium back as opposed to the plastic that you'll see later on on this one. Uh, this one is maybe a little bit cleaner in its integration of all the features. Similar feature set overall to what we have here. This wheel is actually capable of a bit more in terms of functionality than what we have here. You don't have the console compatibility on this particular wheel. This is relying more on, uh, on SimHub. So objectively, this is a higher quality build overall. But look, having said that, the, the quality of the switches, the, the touch points and everything, uh, other than just the rigidity of the wheel that we'll talk about later on, there's not an absolutely massive difference in terms of the actual driving experience between the two wheels. So definitely something that I think is worth at least considering. Uh, we then have the uh, Cube Control CSX3, which we reviewed not all that long ago either. This guy comes in at 1,335 euro at the time that we're filming. Again, check local taxes. In terms of build quality, switch gear on this particular wheel actually doesn't feel quite as nice as it does on this. We do have the aluminum back. We do have a couple of additional paddles here as well overall. But again, I would definitely be considering this wheel and making sure I pay very close attention to this video if you're looking at buying one of these wheels because it definitely is a contender there for a lower price. And the last wheel that I want to compare to directly is something that is monstrously expensive compared to what we're paying for this wheel. So this is the uh, this is the grid uh, engineering Porsche 911 RSR wheel. Again, we do have a full review of this wheel right here on the channel. This guy comes in at a, you might wanna be sitting down for this. This is a whopping 2,249 euro. Now the build quality on this is exceptionally high. Metal construction throughout send. I mean, you can check out the review for yourselves if you wanna see the detail on that. Now, interestingly, on this particular wheel, there was quite a bit of flex in the bottom of the grips, which I didn't actually pick up on when we reviewed the wheel because I didn't notice it when I was driving. But a couple of people pointed it out in the comments on the video. I went back and checked it. And sure enough, there is quite a bit of flex in the bottom there, which there also is present on this particular wheel. So a bit of a point of comparison there, the Solpec wheel and the Cube Controls wheels are both a lot more rigid feeling overall in the hands than uh, either the grid engineering or this particular wheel, despite the price differences there. So that's just one little consideration there, but um, Look, overall, I think that the grid engineering wheel is absolutely fantastic. But for the price difference there, I think that this does a really fantastic job. So what are we actually getting with the FSW3? What's, uh, what's the reason why I'm saying that this is so unique? Now, the best way I can describe this is you can kind of think of this like a integrated computer, whereas most sim racing wheels are just kind of like a dumb terminal that uh, basically you talk to and you tell it what to do. This wheel actually has an integrated computer that pulls that data out of your sim racing titles via some various different software packages and allows you to actually configure everything from the wheel itself, similar to what we saw with the, uh, with the Solpec wheel, although that relies more heavily on integration within SimHub itself. This does work with SimHub, but most of the functionality with this wheel is all done through their own integration. The other thing that really sets this wheel apart is the quality of the display that we have here. So it's a five inch full HD 1920 by 1080 display. It's not a Vocor display like what we see in a lot of other wheels. It's actually their own design in terms of how it's all driven, how it's all managed through software. And we're gonna unpack all of that later on when we jump over on the rig. I'll give you a breakdown of the, uh, of the key functionality there, give you an understanding of exactly what you can do with this wheel but wanted to sort of stay that right from the start here because the screen on this thing is absolutely fantastic. You guys have heard me say in videos of past that uh, you know as long as the resolution is sufficient that you can make out small text, it doesn't really matter. But looking at this screen really is a visual delight. The sharpness is just unlike anything I've ever seen on a sim racing wheel before, more like what you would find on a modern day smartphone. Now contrast ratio, viewing angle and color reproduction are all really fantastic on this as well. Even though you're generally looking at the wheel square on when you're driving, even moving to the sides, it still looks very sharp. The 
colors are still represented really well. You don't get any weird ghosting or you know shadows or anything strange like that. So they really have done an exceptional job on the display with this particular wheel. We've got a 307 millimeter diameter here. We'll talk about the impact of that when we get into our driving experience later on in the video. So stay tuned for that. Uh, quite a heavy wheel, 1.75 kilograms. So that's definitely something that's worth considering too. And again, we'll also unpack that and what it means for the driving experience when we talk about that later on too. Now, in terms of actual functionality on board with the wheel, we talked about how it kind of has an integrated computer. What does that actually mean? What can you actually do with this wheel? So you have two integrated dashboards built into the actual wheel, which pull data in from the various different sim racing titles. So this can actually connect to your PC via USB, pull telemetry in that way. You can connect it to your Wi-Fi network and actually pull telemetry data in that's being broadcast by your sim title in that way as well. And that's the way it actually works with consoles. So if you're playing one of the F1 titles on consoles, I believe the F1 titles are the only things that are working for this on consoles in terms of the display at the time of making this video. But of course that may change into the future. Basically all you do is you connect your wheel to your wireless network. You put in the IP address of the wheel into your sim racing title and it's able to pull in that telemetry, which is really, really cool. So two inbuilt dashes. You then also have a third dash, which allows you to actually go onto their website, configure it however you want within the limitations of their system at least. And it obviously gives you the ability to customize both the look and the, uh, and the data that you're actually getting on the display of the wheel itself. Now, you might be thinking, well, you can just do that with SimHub anyway, and that's true. But obviously if you're integrating the telemetry with say consoles, for example, or you just don't want to use SimHub, it's great that you have that functionality built into the wheel itself. And in my opinion, at least it's just a really really cool feature. We then have injection molded rubber hand grips, which unfortunately are that material that does tend to pick up dirt and debris. They're not overly tacky feeling, but you can see even just here, they have picked up quite a lot of dead skin cells from my hands, just from driving it over the last couple of weeks that we've been testing this out. So. Again, it's a very subjective thing. Most sim racing wheels these days are using this material. You see it used in real life race cars as well. So subjectively, I'm not a massive fan of this material. Uh, the material that you have on the CSX3 by comparison feels quite similar in the hand, a similar kind of squish or shore rating as well, but it just doesn't have that tendency to pick up dirt and debris like what we have on a lot of other wheels. So that's something that bothers you. That is something that's worth considering. One thing, and again, we will unpack this in more detail when we get into the driving experience later on, there is quite a bit of flex in the bottom of this open wheel design compared to a lot of other wheels that are on the market. So that is definitely one thing to consider. And again, we will discuss that in a lot more detail when we get into the driving experience later on. We've got 12 buttons in total on the face of the wheel, 10 on the front, and then if we spin the wheel around, two on the back. You can use that for ERS, DRS deployment, overtake button, whatever else you want. Break magic if you're Lewis Hamilton, although I'm sure he wouldn't be a fan of that. The buttons aren't backlit like what you'll find on a lot of other sim racing wheels these days. To me, that's a bit of a take it or leave it feature. It's not something that I'm overly concerned about, but that said, they are starting to do some pretty darn cool things with RGB backlighting these days on sim racing wheels. You're gonna have the lighting react to what's going on in terms of telemetry, flags, spotters, all kinds of funky things. So no backlighting, but the buttons themselves do have a very nice feel to them. There's a little bit of squish to them before they, uh, before they react, before they click in, but a really nice clearly defined click and they do feel consistent across all of the buttons as well. It is a plastic back on the wheel, we'll touch on that a little bit later on, but you don't get a sort of hollow echoey feeling in the buttons at all. Some of the cheaper wheels that we've tested, uh, the Fanatec Formula wheels in particular, tend to, they, they just feel a little bit hollow. When you push the buttons, although they have a nice click to them, you kind of hear it echo throughout the back of the wheel, and it just gives it a slightly cheaper feeling overall, but this doesn't suffer from that at all. So that is the push buttons. We then have two little joysticks here. One of them is a seven-way funky switch, which allows you to push up, down, left, right, and rotary encoder as well as push button. So really great for doing things like navigating through your black box menu. And this is also actually used for navigating through the menus on the onboard computer, as you'll see later on as well. On the right hand side of the wheel is actually an analog stick. So that can be used for looking around inside the car. You can just use it as a mappable axis or two mappable axes, I should say, up, down and left, right. This actually also controls the cursor on the screen on the onboard computer as well. So for some of the menus, as you'll see later on, you do actually need to be able to move the cursor around to select the thing that you want. And you can also, if you select the right position on this dial that we'll talk about in just a minute, use this as a mouse input on your PC as well. So it actually controls the cursor on your PC, which I did actually find it quite useful for situations where I was using a rig that I didn't have a mouse right next to me. I sometimes put it down on the ground. So just needing to make a quick change, quickly alt tabbing to alter something, I was able to get the job done really well with just that there as well. So it's cool to see them 
you know, really taking, really, I guess, maximizing the functionality with the with the inputs that are available on the wheel and doing some things that we haven't seen, at least I haven't seen before in any other sim racing wheel. We then have four thumb encoders. These are actually interesting as well. These are multi-position switch slash rotary encoders. I don't recall ever testing another sim racing wheel to date at least that actually has multi-position switch functionality for the thumb encoders. Now, the reason why that's significant is because it actually knows the position that the switch is in from one all the way through to 12. So say, for example, you jump into the sim, you want to select engine map number three. You'll go one, two, three, you'll put it on position number three, as I luckily managed to select there without even looking at it. And then position three on the dial will always correlate with map number three inside the sim. So if you're using a rotary encoder, you might go click, click, click to get to engine map number three. And then you exit out of the sim, come back in again, your switch is still in position three, but the car is defaulted back to map number one. So the numbers that you see on the dial don't necessarily correlate with what is going on in the sim. And the reason for that is because you're simply just sending a pulse in either direction as you make that change, rather than actually sending a signal to say, I am in position number three. Now, importantly, you can switch between multi-position switch and rotary encoder modes with this wheel. So if you're driving a sim that doesn't support multi-position switches, that is not a problem. So that's available in all four of these thumb encoders. Now the thumb encoders also have a really nice snap to them in each position, either with or without gloves. There's no mistaking whether or not you've made a movement. There's no looseness, there's no rattling. So big thumbs up for those as well. We then got our four rotary encoder slash multi-position switches here. Now this is quite interesting. We'll get into the functionality and give you a full breakdown of exactly what this can do in just a moment when we get over on the rig. But basically this middle dial here is a uh, selector switch which allows you to select various different modes on the wheel itself. And then that ultimately determines the functionality of some of these rotary encoders and what they do. And again, very, very, very nice feeling on all of these multi-position switch slash rotary encoders, a nice clearly defined snap in each position, right up there with the best of the best that we've ever tested here at Boost Media, at least. Aluminium touch points throughout here as well. So all of these thumb encoders, rotary encoders, uh, the uh, analog switch and the seven way function switch, all anodized aluminium, which is very, very nice. You would expect that at this kind of price point, but a good thing to see anyway. We've already talked about the resolution of the display. So let's move on to the LEDs now. So you do have an array of 21 LEDs on the face of the wheel, 15 across the top for the rev strip, and then three on either side for your flag LEDs. All the functionality is all controlled through the wheel for that as well. One thing to be aware of there is that those aren't RGB LEDs like what we see on a lot of other wheels. These these days. So they are split up between, what is it, five fixed green, seven fixed red, seven fixed blue, and two fixed yellow LEDs. But look, in terms of functionality, how they actually operate, no complaints there whatsoever. I don't see that as really being a big deal, but it may be a deal breaker for you. So just something to be aware of there. So on the back of the wheel, we find the shifters and analog paddles. Now, as we mentioned before, there is a version that doesn't include the analog paddles. And you may have already spotted what I'm gonna complain about with these shifters. And that's the tiniest little thing, and I really don't understand why they haven't done this. But you can see the paddle itself is just a hard cut edge there. It's a really, really nice finish on that carbon fiber. And it is a nice thick uh, five millimeter thick carbon fiber with no real meaningful flex there whatsoever. There's a little bit if you pull on the bottom, but certainly nothing to complain about, but it is quite sharp on the back there. And we're gonna talk about that when we get into the driving experience a little bit later on the impact of that on driving with bare hands. But one little complaint there, otherwise very sturdy, very nice paddles there. We do have a little bit of adjustment in and out. So you can slide the paddle in and out by about 10 millimeters, just to give you a little bit more reach if you needed that and about five millimeters on the analog paddles down the bottom here. So these little indents that you see, these little cutaways on the analog paddles do actually feel quite nice. And you can see there's a nice big throw there on those analog paddles. Those are using Hall Effect sensors, so they are contactless input, and you can switch between arbitrary analog inputs if you want to map it to a handbrake or a throttle on a brake if you can't use pedals for some reason, or whatever else you want. Really nice long throw there, which gives you a lot of control. And I've got to say, these are some of the nicest feeling analog paddles that I've ever felt on a sim racing wheel. A really nice, kind of linear feel to them, not overly progressive, but they almost feel like they've got dampers in them. They don't, but just the way they've integrated that, the smoothness and the, the feeling of that spring is really, really, really nice. So uh, that was one little thing that stood out to me. Uh, in terms of the shifter paddles themselves, those are using micro switches, but they are high quality Omron branded uh, automotive grade micro switches. And you can hear they are relatively quiet as well. Not the quietest shifters that I've ever used, but they do have little rubber stoppers internally, which damps them down a little bit, both on the back 
and the front. So there's no metal to metal contact either direction with the throw. They don't have adjustable throw or adjustable angle or anything like that. It is literally just the paddle that you can move in and out. But ergonomically, I think it's laid out pretty well. I can't really see too many reasons why anybody would need to adjust it. Just that one issue with the square edge on the paddles, which uh, yeah, just seems a little bit strange to me, but otherwise absolutely no complaints there whatsoever. You can see here as well, the CNC machined aluminum hub adapter, which has our zero play quick release on it already, as we mentioned before. There is both a 70 millimeter and a 50 millimeter hole pattern here for mounting whatever quick release you want. And they do include the uh, relevant hardware as well for mounting whatever quick release you decide you want to mount on there. As I mentioned earlier, there is a little bit of flex in the hand grips as we'll discuss when we get into driving, but no flex uh, or no discernible flex when driving at least in the in the hub itself everything else feels very very solid in the wheel despite that plastic back shell on the wheel nice thick usb cable here as well nice and long too and uh, one thing i did notice is that it is integrated into the wheel so it's not removable in any way that does unfortunately mean that if you do damage the cable you will have to either send the wheel away to get repaired if you're not confident to do it yourself or uh, source another cable pull the wheel apart so that is one small nitpick i would prefer to see some sort of a magnetic connection or even just a removable connect like what we see on most other wheels i'm never a fan of fixed cables simply because if the cable gets damaged you know, you don't want to have to pull the wheel apart or send it away to get repaired. But, you know, it's not, a, it's not a huge deal. Just one thing that was a little bit unique about this wheel, which is the reason why I call it out. But a nice thick cable, as you can see there. And then they do also include inside the box as well, this little adapter box. Now this comes with a, it's basically a line driver or a uh, power injector. So it comes with a little 5.5 volt, three amp plug pack, which comes in at 16.5 watts, I believe. And uh, then you've got a USB cable on the other side of that as well. So that plugs into your PC, this plugs into your power. You can see I've just got a little power adapter there because it did come with a, uh, a different style plug compared to what we have in Australia. And then we've literally just got this little jiffy box here with a USB connection on it, which is what we connect our wheel to, a little power switch on the side as well, which I'm glad to see. And then our two cables run in. So similar to what we saw on the wheel, uh, these cables are fixed. So you will have to pull this apart if you ever damage a cable to replace it. One little nitpick there as well as I would like to see some little tabs on this so you can actually screw it directly onto your rig. Although just using a strong double-sided tape is absolutely fine as well. So not really a major issue, but just one little area of tiny improvement that I thought was worth pointing out. So that's pretty much everything you need to know in terms of functionality as it relates to the hardware itself. We talked about the display before and how it integrates with consoles and how you have to put in the IP address of the wheel, which is connected to your wireless network to pull in that UDP broadcaster telemetry. You might be wondering how do the buttons work on console? So this is quite clever as well. What some of you guys might not be aware of is that if you connect a keyboard to your console, you can actually often map the keys on the keyboard to be inputs inside the game. Now this is of course game dependent, so they can't guarantee uh, compatibility across every single game title. But what this wheel essentially does is emulate a keyboard. So when you plug it into your console, it actually thinks that there's a keyboard connected and you can map the buttons to corresponding keys inside the game. So again, it's kind of a bit of a bootleg solution, but it works. And uh, I think it's a really, really clever thing. So between the keyboard emulation and the UDP telemetry, provided that your game supports both UDP telemetry and, uh, and keyboard button mapping, you're pretty much good to go with this wheel, which I think is very, very, very cool. So just before we move over onto the sim rig, just a couple more observations in terms of materials used here. It is a genuine carbon fiber front plate here. It's actually two layers of five millimeter carbon fiber stacked on top of each other for this top plate here. So you can see if we turn it sideways, there is a second plate, which is kind of sitting on top of the first. So they're actually stacked at the top here and you can see the split between the two of them in a, in a few positions up there. But that does give the wheel quite a lot of rigidity overall across the frame. Remembering again that it is a plastic shell on the back of the wheel. We do have some nice little metal shrouds around the buttons up here as well, which are nice for helping you identify the position of the buttons if you're racing in VR. Not that I think a lot of people would be interested in this wheel if they do race VR because you're paying for a screen that you're not gonna be able to see. Uh, although pass-through is becoming quite a cool thing on VR. If you guys have been watching all the millions of reviews on the new uh, Apple Vision uh, headset, pass-through and augmented reality, I think is gonna be a big thing into the future. So maybe it's a future investment, I don't know, but that's something to unpack for another video. But yeah, metal, metal shrouds around these as well. So I think that is everything you need to know in terms of the hardware. 
Where this wheel really shines though is where we get into the functionality. So let's jump over onto the sim rig now and run you through all of that. Now I know from looking at my analytics that uh, the point where we jump over onto the rig and take you through software is usually the point where people get bored and tend to either skip or click off a video. I urge you stay tuned for this one because this wheel really does do some very, very cool stuff that you're gonna wanna see. So I'll see you over on the rig right now. Okay, so all up and running on the sim rig now, time to take you through some of the key features of this wheel. Now, this is an extremely complex wheel as we kind of already touched on in today's video. What I want you to sort of have in your mind while we're going through this is that the wheel itself is kind of the computer in, in this scenario. So normally when we review a wheel, it's kind of a bit of a dumb terminal. You've got a screen that is basically just displaying whatever the screen is told to display from whatever software you're running in the background. So say SIM hub or Z1 dashboard or whatever, it, whatever the case may be. In this case, this is a computer and it's actually pulling information from various different bits of software on your sim racing PC or on your console or whatever it happens to be that you're using. So because of that, there is quite a steep learning curve in terms of actually initializing this thing, getting it set up and running to begin with. Now, what I would recommend you do is actually go through the instruction manual here yourself. This is gonna give you a really good idea if you're looking at buying one of these wheels of all the things that it can do and what you're gonna be up against in terms of setup. So look, I'd be lying if I didn't say that it wasn't quite overwhelming at first, just because there's so many things that you do need to do. Uh, I had to connect it to my Wi-Fi network. I had to adjust IP addresses on my PC to make sure that it was all communicating there properly. I had to install all sorts of plugins for SIM hub and whatnot. So it, it like it all can be a little bit overwhelming. And at first I was kind of like, oh gosh, this thing's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a handful, not, not necessarily in a, a, a bad thing, but you know, it was, a, it was a handful to get up and running initially. But the good news is that once it is all up and running, once it is all configured, everything works pretty seamlessly. It is pretty plug and play. So you fire it up, uh, it automatically connects to SIM hub if it's running, you can run your, your, your dashes and whatnot, and it all just kind of works. So. Yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to make that clear before we get into it because it is a bit of a different mindset with this particular wheel. Now, we already touched briefly on uh, some of the functionality in terms of buttons, switches, rotary encoders, and whatnot, but let's run through now some of the key stuff here. So let's start off with how this, uh, how this center dial works. So as we scroll down here, you can see there is a chart that has all the button numbers on it. Those numbers are also labeled on the wheel itself as well, which is very, very good because as you go down through the manual, it is gonna reference certain buttons that you need to push to perform certain functions. So having the numbers on the wheel itself is a very, very good thing. Uh, it saved me a lot of frustration as I was going through the process. So you can see there's some instructions here for physically connecting to the Fanatec hub. Uh, the instructions for setting all of this uh, telemetry-based stuff up for uh, for your console, so your Xbox, your PlayStation, or whatnot is all gonna vary. We're not gonna go into a lot of detail on that in today's video. Again, just reference the manual here. It is very detailed. It gives you uh, all the information you need to know to know what you're up against if you're looking at buying one of these wheels. So let's scroll on down here until we get to the central encoder. So it says here, the central encoder called SL1 is a multifunction encoder. Understanding its functions is essential to use the steering wheel in the best way. By utilizing buttons 10 and 11, which is these two guys here, plus and minus, in conjunction with the encoder's position, you can control specific settings on the wheel or the car. So position one, as we have it here now, is to change the view, used to change the view inside the dashboard. So if we press plus and minus, it's actually gonna change between pages on the dashboard that we have selected. Now we're gonna talk about the dashboards in a lot more detail in just a moment. Position number two here is just for adjusting the brightness of the green LEDs. Remember again that these aren't RGB selectable LEDs, they are individual colors for each segment. So we can just go up or down on the brightness there, pretty self-explanatory. Likewise with uh, red, blue and yellow, so no need to go into that in any more detail. Then we get down to BBP, which is brake balance preset enabling. So that allows you to change between brake balance presets. Uh, AJSW, analog joystick wheel mode, not yet implemented. So we'll wait to see what that does in the future. Analog joystick PC mode. When SL1 is in this position, you can use the analog joystick here as a mouse. And you can see there, I'm using the analog stick to move that mouse around on the screen, I think you guys should be able to see that. So that is actually quite handy. I know most people will have a mouse nearby on their rig anyway, but some people like to actually, you know, tuck the mouse away or put it out of reach when they're driving. So if you're quickly alt-tabbing out and you just want to quickly make an adjustment that requires a mouse input, that is quite a cool way of doing it. And again, it's, it's cool to see them implementing these kinds of features that you just don't see on other wheels and, you know, making full use of the array of inputs that we have 
on the face of the wheel here. So then we go across to BPC, change bite point clutch offset. When SL1 is in this option, use the SL8 to change the clutch bite point offset. So that's this guy here. So as we wind that up and down, it is simply changing the bite point. Now we don't see a visual representation of the value on the screen here. You just see the adjustment go up and down here. But if we do pull the clutch in and release one of them, you can see there now we do have a display on the screen and as we wind that up, you can see how it's increasing the value. It does the job quite well there. And of course, as I mentioned before, you can, uh, you can change the mode of these to operate as two analog uh, arbitrary axes as well if you don't want to use the bite point mode. So that is BPC. We then have DD, which means delete dashboard, not direct drive. So if you have a custom dashboard that you've created with the dashboard manager that we'll look at in just a moment, uh, you can delete it from this position. EB, extra button, enable button 10, 11, and 13 to be used as normal buttons, only on the PC with USB communication. So what that means is normally the uh, 10, 11, and the 13 button, which I believe is this guy here behind the wheel, are reserved for making adjustments on the wheel itself, remembering again that this is a computer rather than you know just a dumb terminal. So what this does is it allows those buttons to be used to map inside your SIM rather than controlling the wheel. So you can have them perform their normal functions, but if you want to use them inside the game, then you go to the EB setting and that allows us to use those additional buttons. And then finally, we have the CD position, which allows us to change the dashboard. So unlike switching between the pages, we're actually changing the dashboard itself. So there's two dashes actually built into the wheel. Those are like a fixed configuration that you can't alter. There's then the custom dashboard. Again, we'll look at that in just a moment. And then you can also do something really cool here. So let's go through the uh, three that are currently programmed into the wheel. And then if we push up again, what we have now is the dashes that we actually have running in SimHub in the background. So rather than having to go into SimHub and tell it to push the dashboard to the screen like what you might be used to with, uh, with other dashes or wheels, we're actually able to select the dashboard itself from here. So we can scroll through the dashes that we have installed in, uh, in SimHub. We can scroll up and down with our left hand and then use the mouse on our right hand and just click to select the dash that we want. So we're gonna go with lovely dashboard, which is a uh, very popular one. And you can see that just loads up exactly the same as if you were doing it on a smartphone or tablet, which is really cool. It takes a moment to load initially. And there you go, we now have lovely dashboard from SimHub running on our eSports Sim wheel in beautiful full HD resolution. You can see the text there is uh, extremely crisp. So that is a quick rundown on the, on the core function. I think the things that are gonna be most important to you guys. There's a lot of other stuff to unpack here as well, of course, but I just wanna quickly show you as well. If we scroll back down through the settings here, you can see this is where we actually make configurations on the wheel itself. And again, scroll through the instruction manual. Uh, it does run you through all of this stuff in a lot of detail, a lot more detail than I'm gonna go into here. It tells you how to configure everything but the point that I wanna make again here is that these are all settings and adjustments that you're actually making on the wheel itself. So it's not talking to any software in the background on your PC to display all this information on the display. This is all stuff, these are all adjustments that you're making on the wheel itself, which I think is really cool. You can see here, we can adjust our LED brightness. We can adjust our brake balance preset, uh, adjust our gear advanced mode, set the IP address of our PC. Uh, that's just my local IP address for this PC for talking to SimHub, for example. Analog paddle calibration, analog paddle mode, telemetry data sending, and whatnot. It's all here and it's all completely configurable. We're going to go down once more through diagnostic tests as well. So you can see there, it's uh, giving me my IP addresses, firmware version, whatnot. We can test button inputs, make sure everything's connected and doing what it needs to do. Uh, we can update the firmware from the wheel directly itself. It does have a Wi-Fi connection, so it can actually connect to the internet and download firmware updates without having to push anything through your PC, although you can do a firmware update from the PC as well if you want to. It even has a little keyboard that you can uh, bring up here for entering data as well. So for example, if I'm trying to connect to Wi-Fi and you can see I do actually have it already connected here. But if I click on the little Wi-Fi logo, it brings up all of the Wi-Fi networks that I have available in the area. And then uh, if I was to open the keyboard, that is how I would uh, actually enter my password for the Wi-Fi. So it's a little bit clunky and you know, this kind of ties in with what I was saying before about it being a little bit, uh, you know, not, not overly complex, but there's a lot of stuff to go through to get it initially set up. But once it's all set up, 
it is very, very easy to use and it is pretty much just plug and play, which really surprised me. I thought from that initial kind of experience of setting things up, I thought, oh boy, this is gonna be one of those wheels that uh, you, need a, you need a physics degree to, uh, to be able to use, but not really the case. Once it's set up, it does all work very, very well. So what I wanna to quickly touch on now is the dashboard designer, which allows you to actually design your own dashboard on their website and then uh, push it from the website directly to your wheel with its internet connection, which I think is really cool. So look, I think most people will probably ultimately, if they're on a PC, end up using SimHub just because there's so many things that you can do there and you know so much customization available. It kind of goes beyond what you can do here. But this is also a really cool option. And I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here simply because you guys can go here, uh, esportssim.com slash dashboard dash designer and uh, you can actually play around with this yourself without even owning the wheel, which is really cool. But to give you a basic understanding here, you click on the various different elements to add them to the screen. So current lap time, last lap time, for example, whatever you want. You drag them around to whatever position you want, and then you can click on each one to customize it as well. So we can change the width, the size, the offset here, foreground color, background color, text start. So obviously we're gonna maybe change that to say break bias, for example, and then alignment. It's all pretty self-explanatory stuff here. And uh, yeah, then once you're done, once you've got everything on here the way you like it, then you can flash it across to the wheel and it's all good to go. So just to give you a quick rundown on some of the options here, you can see there's a lot of different telemetry data that you can, uh, that you can pull in to make up whatever dash you want. So it's pretty comprehensive to be honest with you guys. I'm very impressed with this, but again, you can play around with this yourself. You don't need to own the wheel to jump on the website right now and take a look for yourself. So we don't really need to spend any more time there. One other thing just to touch on as well is the LEDs. Now, a lot of wheels that we've tested in the past have been quite uh, cumbersome in terms of getting the LEDs working. Uh, you often have to mess around with different SIM hub profiles to get all that working uh, and you know match it to the RPM in each car. Now, in this particular case, everything just kind of worked straight out of the box, which was something that really impressed me. I, uh, I did install the software I had to get it synced up with my PC, but once I did all that, every time I've switched on the rig, every time I've plugged the wheel in, I've just fired it up, jumped on track, and everything has just worked. So pretty simple there. Let's move on now and get into the driving experience. Okay, so what is the wheel like to drive with? Now this was a little bit of a mixed bag overall. There's a couple of things that I think are a little bit polarizing that you definitely need to consider if you're looking at choosing one of these wheels. So first thing is the, the size and the weight of it. So 307 millimeter diameter, it is a little bit larger than what you might be used to for driving formula style cars. Now it is not a direct replica, but it's, it's, it's based upon the design of modern Formula One cars. And I have actually spoken to a couple of actual F1 engineers that have told me that their wheels are around sort of 300 to 310 millimeter diameter. So it is accurate, but it does mean that you have a bit more of a dampening impact on the uh, on the force feedback. So if you're running this on a weaker wheelbase, say something under about 10 Newton meters of, uh, of peak strength, you will find that the force feedback feels a little bit more dampened down. It feels a little bit less responsive, a little bit less reactive and sharp than what you might find on a smaller diameter wheel and a lighter wheel as well. This is quite a heavy wheel at 1.75 kilograms. So that is one thing that you're gonna to wanna to consider as well. Comparing the experience of using this wheel on something like a CSL DD at around that kind of eight Newton meter mark with the boost kit, uh, you do notice the difference in just the, the overall sharpness of the force feedback compared to something like a 270 millimeter wheel like what you get with the Fnatic ecosystem. So what I would say with regards to that is if you really like this wheel, you love the feature set and you know, you've kind of just been sold on, on all the things that the wheel can do, then I, I wouldn't say that that's a deal breaker for you. It's just something that you need to consider. Now, the other thing I think you need to consider if you're looking at buying one of these is the ergonomics of the wheel. It's not gonna suit absolutely everybody. And again, it is based upon the design of modern Formula One style steering wheels. But the reason I mention that is because when you're holding the wheel, you can see my thumbs can only actually reach the analog joystick, the digital joystick, and those two thumb encoders. I can't even reach these thumb encoders cleanly without moving my hand position. You can see all the buttons around the top and the side are all completely out of reach for my hands without rolling my hand position around. Now, if we compare that to something like the uh, Q-Control CSX3, you can see here, everything is just kind of cramped in a little bit more, which you may or may not like, but it's something that's important to consider at least. You can see here, I can operate all of these switches around the side here without having to roll my hand around. Likewise with the uh, Spectre XR from Solpec as well, Again, I can reach all of those buttons, one, two, three, four, and the thumb encoder and the uh, multi-position switch there in the same manner. So 
Again, not necessarily a deal breaker, just something that you do need to be aware of if you're looking at buying one of these wheels. Now there are two more important considerations here just with regards to the build quality and finish of the wheel too. Now the first thing, which is probably the, the biggest detractor I think from this wheel, is the amount of flex that you have in the bottom of the grips. Now you can see some footage on your screen now of me sitting in the rig with the wheel fixed to my wheelbase and twisting the bottoms of those grips. Now obviously that's not something that you're gonna be doing while you're driving, but what I can tell you is that when I was driving with the wheel, I did notice the flex in the bottom of those grips. It is quite noticeable when driving. Now, the reason I say that, and you know, everybody's gonna have different habits when it comes to their driving style. You're supposed to, when you're steering, hold the wheel like this, and you're kind of pushing and pulling with a formula style car, you know, from the tops here. So you're not really ever gripping the bottoms of the wheel. But what I find, and this may just be a bad habit of my own, but it's, it's something that I do regardless. But when I'm turning, I often do kind of push in or pull a little bit on the bottom of the wheel, particularly say if I'm turning right, I do tend to push with the palm of my uh, the palm of my hand or my wrist on the left hand side as I turn, and vice versa. If I'm turning to the left, I tend to push with the right hand. I kind of keep my I kind of keep my arms and my biceps engaged as I'm driving, and because of that, the flex in the bottom of these grips was something that I did notice all the time. Now I did get in contact with Esports Sim about this, and uh, their response. I'll actually I'll read it out to you, so you've got the exact response that they gave me. So what I said to him was one observation that I have is that there's a lot of flex in the lower part of the hand grips. Is this something that you have plans to improve on? And his response was, it's normal when you drive, you don't use much of the lower part. It's carbon fiber inside, so it's flexible, but strong. We make about 600 steering wheels with that shape and the wheels never had a problem with the hand grips. The hand grips are made with a professional sport rubber. The rubber is cut resistant and sweat resistant with excellent grip, even without gloves. So there was a bit of a dismissive response, I think. Um, yeah. It, Look, it, it, it's something that may bother you, it's something that may not bother you. Now, when I reviewed the uh, the grid engineering Porsche 911 RSR wheel, which is a lot more expensive than this wheel admittedly, I actually didn't notice the amount of flex that there is in the bottom of these grips. And somebody actually called it out in the comments on that review. They said, why don't you talk about the flex in the bottom of the wheel? And when I read the comment, I was like, what flex in the bottom of the wheel? And then I actually went and intentionally twisted it. And they were right, there is quite a bit of flex in the bottom of this wheel, but it wasn't so much that I noticed it when I was driving with this wheel, which is the reason why I, I missed it when I did that review. And so that's why I intentionally check this on every single review video that I do now, whether or not I notice it when I'm driving or not. But in this case, it was sufficient that I noticed it, uh, you know, it was quite a significant thing when driving, which is the reason why I'm calling it out specifically. The other thing that I wasn't a huge fan of in terms of the driving experience was the sharp edges on these carbon fiber paddles. Now the finish is really nice. It's a very high quality finish as you guys can see, but it's just quite sharp. They haven't rounded off those edges at all. I don't think it's enough to cause blisters or anything like that unless you were doing like some sort of endurance race. And with gloves, it's not really a problem at all. But I do think that it is a small adjustment to the design that would make it a lot better. But look, otherwise ergonomically, the wheel is very nice. One thing that absolutely did stand out to me with the driving experience is the quality of the switches, whether it's the push button switches or the, uh, or the metal rotary encoders. Every single one of these feels absolutely exceptional. I would say right up there with the best, if not the best, buttons and, uh, and dials that I've ever used on a wheel. And again, when you consider some of the other wheels that we've tested like this that cost more than twice as much, I think that is pretty darn impressive. One thing I did notice which you need to be aware of is that the edges or these little, uh, these little knobs on all of, the, uh, all of the thumb encoders are quite sharp. Again, kind of similar to what we have with the, with the paddles on the back. Not sharp enough that they're gonna cut you or anything like that. But um, you know, if you're doing really long endurance races, you might find that over time they become a little bit uncomfortable without gloves on. But having said that, they do provide a lot of definition. So the feeling of the switch, the activation of the switches is absolutely fantastic. Just if I had my way, I'd make them a little bit more smooth just so that they feel a little bit less abrasive, but something that I do think is important to consider. So otherwise, exceptional experience everywhere else. The paddles, the shifters, they all feel really good as well. Some people might be put off by the plastic shell compared to a lot of other wheels that do have aluminum back shells, but again, like, it doesn't really impact the driving experience. There's no flex coming from there. And I mean, look, all the other wheels that we looked at in today's video, they do all have aluminum backs, but they are all more expensive than this is as well. And look, honestly, I would rather have the plastic backing on this wheel that doesn't have an impact on the driving experience. And you don't even really see it when you're driving anyway, rather than switch that across to aluminum and have the wheel cost more. I think that that's a worthwhile thing, both in terms of reducing the cost 
as well as of course reducing the weight as well given that it is quite a heavy wheel as we already discussed. But look, really I think what it comes down to and the reason why people will be considering this wheel is the functionality overall. And look, it is absolutely exceptionally amazing. Um, you know, the things that you can do with this wheel, I wouldn't have even imagined you could do on a wheel a couple of years ago. It really is like the SF1000 wheel from Thrustmaster on steroids. That's probably the best way I can describe it. So as we covered when we were looking at the software earlier, there is quite a bit involved in getting it set up initially. There's various different software packages and you know installation things that you need to do, steps that you need to take to get it up and running initially depending on the sim that you're racing and software that you might wanting to be uh, integrating it with. But once you've got all that up and running, even on console, it is very simple to use. And I really love the fact that uh, at least for the F1 games that have that output for telemetry via an IP address, you can actually connect the wheel to your wireless network, put in the IP address of your wheel and actually have that telemetry go from console to the wheel. That's something that you definitely don't see in a lot of sim racing wheels and something that I think will be a, uh, a pretty big selling point for this particular wheel. Now, would I recommend that you go out and spend this much money on a wheel specifically for console? Probably not. What I would say is if you're looking at investing this kind of money, you might want to maybe consider saving that money, saving it towards a PC setup, and then looking at getting wheels later on down the track. And the reason I say that is while there are some really fantastic sim racing titles available on consoles, the overall diversity in the genre and you know just the availability of online races to compete in outside of league racing, of course, on consoles is inferior to what it is on PC. So in my opinion, and this is just purely my own subjective opinion, feel free to disagree with me on this, but it is a lot of money to invest in a setup for console racing. But if it's what you want and you can afford it, then it is a really great option. But look, overall, I'm just happy to see this kind of innovation in sim racing. You know, it's very difficult for small companies to you know come out of the gate with, with products that they've obviously put a massive amount of R&D into. You know, the fact that they've written all their own software for this, it's all their own, you know, firmware and everything as well. They're not relying on any sort of third party systems to get up and running, although they do have that sim hub integration, which is a good thing. But you know, a lot of other sim racing wheels that we've tested do rely pretty much 100% on third party software to, you know, to enable their full functionality. And so I think that's definitely something that's worth calling out with this wheel, the fact that they do everything in house, their own software, their own firmware. I think that's something that we should be both celebrating and supporting within sim racing. And I think that's pretty much everything there is to say about the eSports sim FSW version version three. Overall, a very, very positive experience. I just wish that it didn't have as much flex in the lower grips. And as I said, it may or may not be an issue for you, but for me, it was definitely something that I noticed when I was driving. And that is it guys. So hopefully today's video has helped you out. If it has, please leave a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well so you don't miss out on future videos like this one. Believe it or not, only about 30% uh, of the people that watch these videos are actually subscribed to the channel. And subscribing is an awesome way of helping YouTube to understand that the content's valuable so it shows it to other sim racers like you. And if you find out content valuable as well and you do want to pick up any of the gear that we've talked about in today's video and we do have some affiliate links available for all of these products linked down in the description so that's an awesome way of helping support our work at no additional cost to you and we massively appreciate your support there as well that's what keeps us running so thank you very much for that and uh, that is it i'll see you again very soon bye